Yo, what is going on? This is your man L Jamal coming through with another edition of Upon Further Review. Uh, for this installment, of course, it's, it is Black History Month. I wanted to get into some black cinema. Uh, today, I wanted to cover uh, Cooley High, uh, premiering in 1975. I wanted to get into this. Um, not only did it, was it a movie that I liked growing up, but also a movie that my family uh my household like growing up too now years before i even saw the movie uh my grandparents would talk about this movie a whole lot and i pretty much even before i saw the movie kind of had an idea what it was about in my head i would recount all these stories that they would tell me about the characters and i would hear the names of cochise and puta and also preach and um it stayed with me for a long time so one day i happened to catch it I believe it was either on demand or whatever on on cable one day and I was able to spot it out and I was telling my you know grandparents oh it's so on it's so on let's watch it let's let's enjoy this and it really was a good day and we really kicked back and enjoyed ourselves and uh, it was a really good experience to, to share that uh, to have them share that with me uh, a little piece of you know their you know their life uh and their you know their background with me in this in, you know in the modern era so i i, I always like sharing that with them and having that moment with them uh being especially now that my grandmother has passed and it's a movie that she really liked a lot uh coming up in her in her uh adult years and when she was he when she was a young adult and um uh, it's something that I, this is a movie that i really uh, have grown fond of too but Cooley High highlights the exploits of Preach, uh, played by Glenn Turman. Uh, if you if you are familiar with the face, of course he was on HBO's The Wire, uh, a couple other uh, movies as well and TV shows as well. But that was one of the main ones. Uh, he is a poet, a writer, and his friend Coach Heath, played by Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. Again, somebody uh, in our in our community that we know well of. I'm pretty sure you remember the face from um, the Jacksons, the American story. That very long, long as TV special about the Jacksons he was he played Joe Jackson and he's a star ba basketball player in the city in the city of Chicago now of course this highlights their senior year at Edwin G Cooley High in the year 1964 the writer of the movie Eric Monty was influenced by the neighborhood in which he grew up the Cabrini Green housing projects in Chicago's near north side and the actual Cooley High, which he attended, Edwin G. Cooley High, uh, that ended up closing in 1979. And this was a quote that I thought, uh, this is this comes from him, uh, Mr. Monty, the, the writer of the movie. And I pretty much, um, I like this quote because it sums up pretty much what I saw in the movie. Uh, he went on to say, I grew up in the Cabrini Green housing project and I had one of the best times of my life. The most fun you could have. Uh, while inhaling and exhaling and I thought this was a really powerful quote because you pretty much see that through begin uh, through the beginning and all the way into the end of the movie uh, the movie uh, does a good job especially in the beginning of giving you a showcase of what Chicago is and some of them the best shots of a city skyline I have seen um, in any movie uh, regardless of era and uh, specifically because we're going back in time a little bit, uh, this movie comes back in 1975, you kind of get a time capsule of what, and of course is depicting the year 1964, so you kind of get a time capsule of what this city and what our, what our peoples was doing back in this time, and it... Um, it's really a truly it's a treat to see, you know, just to kind of see uh, how things are not that different, how things are different in, in ways. Uh, but the movie starts off hey, with Coach Cheese no uh, waking up, preach. They got to get to class. They're a little bit late. Uh, they finally and get to class, uh, but of course, uh, they're not having a good time. They're all bored in class. And preach decides to uh, figure out a plot to get them uh, to weasel their way out of class. And um, while the teacher is, is going over the role and everything, he uh he snatches well he's able to sneak and get some of her classmates to take the take her uh, nail polish and they take the nail polish and they uh put it on a napkin and they pretend that poot is having a, a nosebleed so this distracts the teacher enough uh, and it gives them the clearance to leave the classroom and of course everybody distracted coach East sneaks out with him so it's poot coach East, and preach uh they already ditching class we already a few minutes in and it's on. It's a party time. Um, as they de as they dish class, they meet up with another uh, partner of theirs, and they head to Lincoln Park. And this is where a couple of my most favorite scenes in the movie come in. Uh, the first is coming up at the concession stand. Uh, they already hitch a ride on the back of the bus. They, you know, they they get the ride to the zoo, and they get to the concession stand and. 
Of course, you don't have enough money to get, you know, the hot dog. So Preacher's distracting the concession stand lady, and he's going back and forth about the hot dogs. Well, where's the ketchup? There ain't no ketchup. We don't have ketchup. What you mean? And so, you know, it's a back and forth, and he finally says, what? You know what? You want it? You like ketchup? You like mustard on your hot dog? She said, yeah, I like ketchup on my hot dog. Here, you take it. Gives it back. Mind you, you know, Cochise and Poodle, they sell the snacks in the other pot that they offer me snacks. So they make off with a good, with a good, uh, with a good amount. And, um, after which, uh, they get to the gorilla cage. And this is another funny ass scene. And, um, the boys are sitting there messing with the gorilla. They, uh, open this door to kind of get into the back, uh, kind of into the, we're closer to his cage. And they start roasting. They start roasting Pooh. They say, yo, daddy look like the gorilla. Yo, yo, daddy eat like the gorilla. And and Pooh like, man, you know, you got to mess. You got to lay up off me and the gorilla pretty much. And he's like, man, you got to treat the gorilla with respect. As soon as he says that, the gorilla throws a big ass pile of doo-doo on his shirt. And everybody starts busting out laughing. Even the, even the even the gorilla is rolling around basically laughing so two of the funniest things i pretty so uh, so much so far in the movie in the beginning um it just kind of gets you get you going and it's hilarious but uh after chilling at the zoo for a while uh the crew heads uh back to the neighborhood to shoot some hoops uh but who but poot also needed to change his clothes and get some textbooks uh later on when every, everybody would meet up at the neighborhood spot martha's uh pretty much a chill out spot there's food and all that food and drink pretty much everybody slides there at the school and pretty much everybody in the community not just the kids uh now priest um this is where Preach, Preach finally lays his eyes on Brenda. Now, she's a big part of the story. And, of course, she's the light-skinned, you know, love interest of Preach. And uh, definitely bougie. Uh, and definitely in the beginning wasn't trying to give Preach no play. Uh, so, you know, you get that dichotomy. They go, they have a little bit of a back and forth. Now, um, what, uh, what Preach likes to do is he likes to come over to Martha's and he likes to shoot dice. Uh, with Robert, with two castles, two older G's from the neighborhood. I wouldn't say they, you know, necessarily like old G's, but you know they older than they older than the high school kids. So he's he's shooting dice with Robert and Stone. He ain't supposed to be doing that. So Martha comes out and chase, chases him out with a meat cleaver. Everybody in the spot, you know, they find it funny. They juiced about that, and uh, you know you see already some wacky stuff going on. But uh, now later on, Coach East will come on, uh, come back home. And you will find out uh, that he was actually uh, accepted into Grambling State on a basketball scholarship. In the beginning, I said he was a, pretty much an all-city athlete. Again, uh, he was being offered scholarships. And this is a really powerful powerful scene to me because you, you kind of see uh, the environment a lot of these guys are living in. And, of course, we're talking about 1960 Chicago in the Cabrini Green Projects. A lot of these guys financially aren't living so well in in this scene, you see Cotisa's little brother, a little baby, and, um, you know, and they living in, you know, this, this, you know, this poverty. You're not judging them because you understand what it is, but the little brother, uh, he, you know, he has, you know, Cochise's scholarship letter, and he's at, he actually dropped it in the toilet. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't, you know, and you just see it, and, but, you know, he's able to get the, get the, you know, letter out of the toilet, and he's able to read it and, and decipher that he's been given this scholarship, but it just kind of shows you just kind of the situation uh, these people are in, and, you know, he had, you know, he had his, he, that was his opportunity to get out of that situation and eventually, hopefully, be able to help his family, so it's just, again, to see that kind of uh, powerful scene like that and, and to have that triumph at the end of it. Um, that, looked, that, was really, that was really solid on the part of the direction of the movie. Now to celebrate all this, he links up with the squad to partake in some of that classic wild Irish rose. Uh, that is a malt liquor from back in the day. I don't even think it exists anymore. Um, it's something that my grandpa would refer to as rock gut. It's pretty much trash and it will fuck up your insides. But again, it was cheap and you know, all the, the young cats that wanted to, you know, sneak and get some liquor, that'll pretty much be their first step back in the day, you know. Hey. But um after they get after they get a little tipsy, they hit up a quarter party hosted by one of their classmates, Donna. At the party, Preach uh, sees Brenda again, and although she originally rejects him, she does open up to him a little bit when she uh, discovers she has a genuine interest in writing and poetry. So they talk a little bit about poetry and, and writing, and they're kind of bonding a little bit. Uh, but the party gets crashed when another cat from the school shows up named Damon, and he, see, uh, he sees Coach Cheese dancing with his girlfriend, Loretta, and they get into a squabble. 
Now, uh, of course, you know, I get it. Damon sees another, you know, sees Coach Chiefs with his girl. But your girl, she obviously open. So, I mean, I mean, of course, I'm mad at Coach Chiefs, but it wasn't like, you know, I'd have been like, yo, we done. <laughs> I don't need to know no explanations. You think you all that? I wouldn't be mad at Coach Chiefs. I mean, he's a star basketball player. The girl think he got the juice. I'm not so mad. I mean, it's the girl that was the problem, not so much Coach Chiefs. But anyways, Coach Chiefs had to get into a fight, and he had to defend himself. He ended up winning the fight. But mind you, Damon, he will be, he will still be in the picture. This ain't it. This ain't it for him. He will return. Now after the party, Coach Chiefs pooped. And Preach meet up with another one of their uh, buddies, Tyrone, at Martha's. And a little later, uh, Stone and Robert would show back up and would pull up to the spot in a Cadillac that they stole. Now, Preach and Coach Reese would go along, to, would go along and ride with them just around the town. Uh, they would cruise through their neighborhood, downtown Chicago, as well as the Gold Coast, which, again, is another area, well, well-to-do area in Chicago. Now, Preach would go on and on about, you know, his fabricated stories about driving for Shy towns elites and convinces Stone to let him drive. And as you can tell, that it doesn't, well, you haven't, if for those of you who haven't seen it yet, it don't go right. And uh, first of all, Preach can't drive. Everything he's been saying, like I said, is fabricated. So uh, he draws some attention to the cops. They start, a, it starts a chase. But, you know. They are able to get away despite hitting it's hitting another car. Now the next day they decide to go to the movies and um, they were all short on cash, so they had to do something. So Preach and Coach Cheese get the idea to hit up two prostitutes and then disguise themselves as cops. And they go ahead because they had like one of them little fake badges laying around, like one of those little toy badges around in their house. And um, they decide to hit up the two prostitutes, like I said, disguised as cops, and kind of, you know, was shaking them down. And they, and then one of them, one of the prostitutes said, "Look, here's ten dollars. Leave us alone." Blah 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 blah. Long story short, you know, the hookers find out, but it's too late. They already down the street on the way to the movies. But at the movies, uh, the guys check out Godzilla versus Mothra, but Puda, uh, he ends up losing his seat. Uh, when he goes to get some snacks, uh, Coach Cheese and Preach got their girlfriends with him, so they not really interested in giving him a spot. And so he, he's, you know, he, they, he's kind of shut out. He's trying to trying to find himself a spot, and he ends up bumping into a gangster disciple. And this gangster disciple, I don't know. I guess he's having a bad day. He gets set off by this little kid, kind of bumping it, or this, you know, this relatively young cat bumping into him, and he starts to give him trouble. But then out of nowhere, a member of another gang called the Counts called out that gangster disciple for picking on Pooh, and an all-out fight would break out in the movie theater. They they ripped the screen up. It was pandemonium. Uh, it was wild because. Um, I've heard of many situations in which that had happened, well, stuff like that went down back in the day. Again, I can't think of too many, I can't think of any times where that had happened. I mean, it happens, but not in a movie theater. Like, I've heard about, you know, well, I've seen it happen in the mall. It might have happened at the schoolyard for us. But I've never seen it at a movie theater, and they ripping down the projectors and all that. That was crazy. Um, again, when my grandparents were like, yeah, that happened. That used to happen all the time. Well, not all the time, but you know what I'm saying. Like, it would happen. I'm like, damn, for real? Okay. So you kind of, again, like, you know, especially having my parents, my grandparents there to kind of watch it with me, kind of go back. We used to talk, and I would ask them questions. Like, Did y'all used to kind of do that too? Yeah, you know, and it was kind of it was kind of cool it was really cool actually to kind of uh touch base with them on that but anyways uh after after you know the movies and everything the next day preacher finally gets some alone time with brenda now again like i said they had already kind of made this spark made this connection and um he finally gets brenda to come over to the crib and again you know um i one thing i did like about this movie is that um, of course it was mentioned that she was light skinned and it was references to her being high yellow of course um, but preach himself and what I liked about how they did it was they didn't make his obsession over her based on that uh, definitely she was pretty uh, definitely she ended up being of course when she started to open up as a character you started to see okay she's she's intelligent she has some some intelligence with her you know she has a keen mind and I think it's it's those things that preach liked and I, I liked how the movie highlighted that instead of her just being you know just super pretty or light skin or whatever like that because it was it was mentioned amongst other people um coach he said kind of joked about it once like you ain't got no shot at that but uh preach had never came out of like oh man you some light skin honey and all this that and the other 
so I definitely liked that it kept it down to earth and um, again this movie was really down to earth it wasn't some Hollywood production uh, well I mean of course you know hey but it wasn't it wasn't Hollywood in the sense of it was inauthentic it was authentic to the point of I believe you know the, the city of course the background and just the situations themselves were just really organic um, and just you know something that you would you would you would definitely see back in the day in those neighborhoods now again like i said they get closer she, he brings over brenda to the house and of course they end up you know having sex and um they do it they have a pretty you know they have a good moment but preach uh decides to open his big ass mouth and reveal that he and of course uh coach Reese had a bet they did have a bet to see uh whether or not he was gonna be able to hit that and again he slipped up and said it i wouldn't have said nothing and another thing about preach at the same time is although i liked you know kind of his healthiness or i I guess well let's just say in lack of better terms he was still dealing with somebody else as well so he kind of put himself in a position there he kind of got the girl that he liked liked but again yeah so it didn't really all work all out uh brenda ended up storming out the house that day you know wasn't talking to him for a minute uh there's also a scene where um you know uh preachers would be ex or yeah pretty much his ex at this point um but was the girl that he was talking to while he was you know trying to get at brenda uh brenda hadn't been talking to him like two three days she finally sees him when the ex is around she kisses him right in front of the girl and yeah that sets that situation off so again uh not so you know not so much good luck for preach right now Finally, when the guys return to school, Coach Heese and Preach are arrested for Grand Theft Auto. Yes, we're talking about the previous night's encounters with Robert and Stone. The police show up. They right in the classroom. Uh, they come up, to, come up in there. They like, we need Coach Heese and, and Preach. Of course, I think they use their real names, of course. But I'm like, damn. Oh, for real. Now, at the station, they meet up again with Stone and Robert, who were also taken in. Uh, the boys were saved uh, by their history teacher, Mr. Mason, played by Garrett Morris, another phenomenal black actor who's been in many countless movies, TV shows. Um, the one that I can think of off the top of my head is the Jamie Foxx show, but that's just because that's just the first one that came to mind. And I brought it up the other day. <laughs> now, he happens to be friends with the arresting officer. They go back. They over here sharing. I, again, this must be the time period. They over here sharing a joint in the fucking interrogation room, whatever. They over here sharing joints and shit. He like, man, can you let these go? These guys go. They good kids, even though they don't go to class. <laughs> That's how you know, like, you know, people had your back. You, you gotta respect it. Um, and this ended up helping them out. Now. I don't know if this was the way that the movie planned it or how they shot it or if this was just the, the procedure of the time. Again, like I told you, like right when they were brought in to be questioned, they met up with Stone and Robert. Now, when they upon their release, they had to go past Stone and Robert and Stone and Robert saw them leaving. This gives them the impression of, oh, they, they snitched on us because, again, um, you know, because of their record, Stone and Robert had to go down. But the thing is, the cold part is for what it's worth now. Um, Mr. Mason would actually put in a good word for them, too. Uh, you know, it kind of say, hey, but what about these guys? And do say straight up, the officer was like, I can't even do nothing about them. They got a record. He's like, I'm already, you know, you already, you know, pushing my hand by letting Coach Chiefs and Preach go. They need, he was like, they need to be taught a lesson. This is a brother now. And uh, he let them go, but Stone and Preach, I mean, Stone and uh, Stone and Robert didn't have so much fucking again. Maybe this is the procedure at the time. They had them in the same room right before they went to get questioned. And then right as they were leaving, uh, they they exited Coach East and Preach exited in the same line of sight. So, it, again, it gives you the impression that they snitched and they didn't. You know, they had somebody putting a good word for them, but... That's not how it saw. That's not how it was saw, and that's not how it was perceived in the course war travels. Thanks to none other than your boy Damon, the sucker that couldn't fight at the quarter party. Yep, he opened his mouth, uh, got everybody mad at Coach Sheets, uh, all at all at the basketball practice, and you know it's it's all bad. You know he opened. You know he's like, man, he he basically he was like, yeah, they snitched on, me. and they didn't. Again, he, they did not. Uh, but eventually, Preach will find out through Mr. Mason that it was, you know, him that helped him out. He put in a good word for him. And he tried to catch it up with Coach Chiefs a little. No, uh, he bumps into Jimmy Ray, which is um, which is Coach Chiefs' older cousin. Again, another all-star 
Uh, he's been in so many black movies, it's not even funny. If you look at the man who played, I think his name, Jimmy Ray, that man looks the same now, I think maybe with some gray hairs, that he's, as he did back in 1975. When they tell you black don't crack, black really don't crack. Believe me, I've just turned 30, and people still keep telling me I'm like 18, and I don't like it, and I got to get carded. But hey, that's life, right? Anyway. Now he's pissed off Of course Preacher's pissed off He heads down to Martha And he bumps into Brenda And he wants to go to her To apologize Cause again You know he realizes That's who he likes You know And he, he fucked that up And uh, he tells her uh, Pretty much kind of Sneaks in there Because I believe He sees Damon He knows Damon Is a he's, You know He's the real one Kind of snitching And kind of You know Point You know Doing the extra Doing the most And uh, he pretty much Don't want to spend Too much time there But he tells Brenda to, Hey come on and meet me uh, About 15 minutes After this so uh, he's like I said, he saw Damon, he sees Damon and um, they kind of lock eyes. And then when he tries to get about the out the spot, uh, Damon, like the sucker he is, he's over there, you know, because uh, Stone and Rob had just came in the spot, too. He's over there like, oh, hey, what's up, preach? Like he's trying to get his attention, like, like, oh, hey, preach, like, woo, woo, woo. And then Stone and Robert, they come up, they about to be, you know, try to beat him down. But uh, here come out, here comes Martha. They chase, he, she chases everybody out with the meat cleaver. Uh, but she does, and this is after preach actually has to hide in the bathroom. And this scene is funny as well. He's in there with this other girl. And she's over there like, get out of here. What are you doing? What are you doing? She's hitting him upside the head with the toilet bowl cleaner. That shit is hilarious. She's like, what are you doing? Get out of here. He's like, I, I got nowhere to go. Stone and Robert is right outside the door. It's like, you got to come out here sometime. But again, like I said, Martha lets him escape out the back. Uh... Rob and Stone and Damon did intercept him, intercept him originally, but he is able to slip away. He's able to uh, meet up with Brenda, who tells him that, oh, man, Cochise had been down there. He was looking for you. Boo, boo, boo. So this this prompts Preach to go on a on a manhunt, pretty much. He's trying to find Cochise, but unfortunately, before he's able to meet up with him, uh, Damon, Rob, and Stone catch up with him, and they, they stomp him out, and uh, they beat on him. And they beat him uh, pretty much to the point of death. And by the time uh, Preach finds him, he's pretty much face down. And uh, it's not a good look. And it's a little sad. Like, it's it's a little sad. And um, again, um, the funeral is over. Well, sorry. Well, there's a funeral, of course, for him. Uh, so that means, of course, uh, of course well, with him dying, you know, of course, he doesn't get to follow through with his dreams or nothing like that. But... At the funeral, everybody is there except for Preach. He slides to a little bit later. There's a scene where he uh, says to him a poem, reads him a poem a little bit. Uh, he pours out a little bit of liquor for him. And um, the movie ends with him kind of walking off and, 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 you know, experiencing his life. He moves on. He finally gets to uh, Hollywood and because of, uh, you know, famous screenwriter that being preach um there's also some um uh, finalities in terms of stories story 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 for the rest of the guys um now with that being said that's the that's pretty much the wrap up of the movie in terms of the plot um in terms of what i liked about it again um just the story itself from beginning to end uh the only thing i could take away from it you know and you know because again i not to say, i'm not gonna say that this movie well, again, I, maybe I am still, you know, like I said, I'm a novice at what you would call reviewing and all that. But even with that being said, I, I can't say there's anything that did not work with this movie or took away from its value. Uh, one thing personally for me, I just didn't like, you know, the ending where Coach East had to die. That's about it for me. But uh, the movie itself was was good, was really well acted. It was well produced. It was well written. The, the story itself uh made sense there was no real fallical errors or you know fallical loopholes things made sense the stories uh uh added up you know there was and again um the cinematography and the shots in the movie of the shots of the city and the way that they would transition uh you know scenes like the car uh the car uh chase and just the, the car drive as well with stone and robert where they kind of showcase to you different parts of the city different angles of the city that was nice uh one of the biggest aspects of this movie one of the biggest aspects of my uh, in this movie in my opinion was the soundtrack motown heavy uh one of the best examples of that uh well of course in the beginning you got baby love by the by the supremes playing uh kind of setting up the day setting up the 
the the tone of the movie, of course, uh, with it being set in 1964. Uh, but my favorite use of the soundtrack in the movie was um, this track by Fingertips by Stevie Wonder, and uh, it you know it just kind of uh, follows the uh, high energy of the guys, and uh, you know you'd have to have some stamina to hang out with these dudes because they running throughout the whole, especially the beginning of the movie, they are running from point A to B, point B. That's a strong draw that they got. Now, I'm not saying that they sprinting, they not no no sprinters and no world athletes, but uh you know they got some stamina and they are jogging <laughs> this movie. But um, I like how the music encapsulates that. I like how the music encapsulates all the different moments of the movie. Of course, uh, at the end, at the funeral, uh, at Cochise's at Cochise's funeral, you got the four tops uh, with that. I'll be there, and um, you know, again, um, it fits. You know, everything seems to fit in this movie. I, I think uh, from beginning to end, it it's really solid, it's a, and it's a reflection of who we were back then and who we you know somewhat still are you know this is why black cinema matters and again i think uh, this is why it's important for us uh, as black um, youtube or you know people who are into the media or you know critics to really take another look at these movies because i feel like in the grand scheme of things in the big time you know your regular guys you know i'm not and this is not to disparage them your robert eager egerts or your nostalgia critics or your nostalgia chicks but sometimes uh, not for lack of a better term they sometimes miss the mark because they don't they don't know all these situations they don't know all these stories they didn't grow up with all this so when they see it it's different so it's important for us to look back on these things and and to remember what we were taught and uh try to share that for everybody else so they can better understand what they're looking at so they don't look at it and go, oh, well, you know, I don't really get that. Let me get this movie a C. This movie ain't a C. This movie ain't a C movie. This movie is, I would say, for what it's worth, it's comedy, a teen comedy. It's probably one of the best out there. It's probably one of the few that I can really say that's really an A-rated movie uh, of this type of, of genre. Um, you can put this on a level of a, again, it's just, you know, again, just for people to kind of get a point of reference. We're talking about a, we're talking about a movie like A Days and Confused. But again, you know, a different urban setting, a 1960s setting in a specific city. We're talking um, Fast Times at Richmond High type of vibes. We're talking The Wood, but again, throwback, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so again, there's... It, and that's and that's how you can tell this movie again I, I i would highly suggest everybody all backgrounds to check this movie out if you want a good laugh you want a good story to look at characters you can bond with check this movie out uh, i'm gonna give it an a rating uh five stars i say it's, it's worth it i say it's worth the watch the hour and 47 minutes it is on free on youtube as we speak so please y'all um do me a favor and check this one out. All right, y'all. I'm calling it a wrap for now. This has been another edition of Pond for the Review. If you want to check it, uh, check any more out, uh, be sure to follow me and uh, subscribe and uh, you know click on those notifications and you'll know exactly what's going on. All right, y'all. This is your man El Jamal signing out for now.